what are we doing today? We're talking about open source, because this is the open source conference, as applied to services. Services um, where oftentimes we end up building them or operating them in a non-open source way. And so we're going to talk about how to change that. I'm going to talk about some of the theory, some of what you know, principles we need to apply, and how we might go about it. Michal is going to talk about the actual use cases, how, to, how it is happening in certain services, um, and how, they're, how yeah, open source is being used, where the gaps are, and so on, kind of a scorecard analysis. So we have two back-to-back -back slots, and we're going to, yeah, that's what we're going to cover in this session. So first I want to talk about, like, what the hell are services? I mean, we, all, we are all very familiar with this idea that, uh, that some software is a service, but what does it actually mean? And someone asked this good question. It was Eric Helms, like, wait a second, tell me specifically what, why is this software a service? And so, so we figured out, and I think it's obvious once you think about it, that services are software that you run for someone else rather than asking that person to run or operate the software themselves. So when you run software for yourself on your own laptop, that's not a service, but when you run it for someone else, when you're operating for someone else, that's what we consider a service. Um, and why, why is this interesting? Well, it turns out that operating a software is hard, especially as it gets more and more complicated, and um, many people don't want to do it. And they would like to have someone else, like this guy here, run the software for them. In fact, um, they, people who, who, I think that's a fundamental principle that we have to remember, is that if we force people to run the software themselves, we've, even if it's a service, we've lost the fundamental reason that they came and, and, and are using the service in the first place. If they wanted to operate it, they would have chosen software that they can run themselves. So, and secondly, one of the big advantages of services is that you can, do, you can bring a lot more benefits, a lot more value to the user of the service than just what is in the source code or what is in the actual application, the actual binary. The fact that it can be connected really easily with other services or the fact that you can do the operations for it, the fact that in the background you can, you can scale it depending on its workload, the fact that you can um, have multiple users interact with each other in that service really easily. There's so many different advantages. And of course, some of the value of a service is in the source code, absolutely, but it's far less than in software that you run yourself, like the percentage. Let's imagine on, on, your, on your laptop when you're running software, the percentage of the interesting parts, the value that's in the source code written there that are, that are providing you with some benefit is very high. On a service, it's a much less of a percentile. There's many other things that provide the value as well. And fundamentally, this means that it is harder to take a service and make a second copy of it. Because you not only have to make a second copy of the service, I'm sorry, of the software, but you would have to make a second copy of all of these things, the way it authenticates with other services, the way that it's operated, which users are using it, the network effect, and so on. And for any interesting service, that becomes very prohibitive to pull off. So those are the fundamental concepts around services that I wanted to share. So let's go into open source. So you, we're all familiar with this about open source, is that we have people who come, we share the source code, and the ideal is that someone comes by and gives a patch or checks it out, makes a change, we have a community, a community builds, there's interest around the software that we run. And this is a fundamental function that open source converts users into contributors. A small fraction of the users, depending of course on the project, some convert most of the users, some convert very small amount, but it does, but we do that. The problem is that open source starves when you, can, when you inhibit that function of converting users to contributors. Um, so here's an example of an amazing community, Postgres, where I don't know if any of you actually, I haven't contributed in a while, but when I did contribute, I was super impressed with how they accepted me as a contributor, looked at my patch, actually worked on it, reviewed it, and brought it through their cycle. I felt like suddenly I was part of the team. Um, I, was, I was blown away by how that community works. We also have 
Amazon running Postgres for uh, different, different uh, users. And of course, there's tons of benefits there. There's high availability, there's backups, there's, you don't have to operate it yourself, there's a lot of less complexity and so on. But it is not possible, if you're using uh, Postgres in that way, as Amazon RDS, to figure out what is it doing, introspect the code, actually change something, make a contribution, and become part of the community. And so over time, if, if all the software is run in that way, we start to starve for contributors in open source. And this is a problem that I'd like to contribute to solving. You can see this diagram here. You know, open source software, there's, we slowly whittle down the amount of participants each time we take a step here from the top down. So the first time you might notice, okay, the software is broken, I, need to, I, sh I should look at it, maybe it needs a change. And then the, the user figures out, oh, I can contribute. Um, then, okay, let's figure out what code I can change, what's going on here, maybe I'll put a printf line, like how do I run this thing that I just changed? Oh, my change broke, how do I, how do I fix it? Um, how can other people use my change? How can I contribute it to the project and so on? And each time there's less and less people that stay with it. And that's why we have a small fraction of the users become contributors. But with software as a service, it's way harder and we lose everyone pretty much right away today. So how do we change this? Um, and, and if we regress from this um, open source development model that we depend on, we take for granted. We take for granted that we can go and look at the code that's running and see what happens when we pass a different flag to an API, for example, or whatever. When we, when we lose that, we lose our basic practices that we use to our advantage. Um, so because, this, because services don't have a distribution where you copy the service to everyone's computer, licenses, that is to say copyright licenses, are insufficient to power open source in this context. They're necessary, but insufficient, because a service is not necessarily copied multiple times, like we talked about earlier. There's oftentimes just one viable place for the service to run, or a couple. It's very difficult to copy all of those capabilities because it's not all in the source code. It's in the interconnections, it's in the users, it's in their data, it's in how the service is used. And so, we can't rely completely on open source licenses to be the thing that powers open source and services. So we, had to, we, we were talking about this with, with some of you and, and, um, and in, the, in the Operate First community, this is a community that, that, taught, that has a goal of operating services together with, not just in one company, but together with different companies, different communities, different participants. And we came up with, uh, uh, two self-evident minimum open source requirements for services. And I'd like to share these with you. And it took a, it took a lot of discussion back around on how, how this would work and what, it would, what would come about. And I'd be interested in your contributions, your participation, or your feedback on these. Um, but it's pretty basic and simple, yeah? Right. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I will definitely, I'll definitely explain that once we show the. Oh, okay. So uh, the question is, what is, why is this self-evident? What does that mean? And I'll get back to that. So, um, the so the two, there's two principles, two two requirements. The first one is that all of the services code assets necessary to operate the service are shared under an open source license and publicly accessible. It's pretty obvious. It's not just the source code. It's what is necessary to operate it, everything that's part of the service. And the second one is that a public contributor can use the same workflow as a typical team member to make a change to the service. These are really simple things. So the question is, why are they self-evident? We discovered this ourselves. We didn't start with the idea oh, we're going to make something self-evident. The reason that they, I believe that they're self-evident is because by doing these two things on a service, you enable someone outside of the team working on the service, a public contributor, to take the open source aspect further, to fork, to build a community, to implement the ability to run it somewhere else on a different infrastructure if necessary, to operate in a different way. You enable, this is the core 
capabilities that when a service has them, these two requirements, you enable others to progress it to more full open source uh, capabilities, more, more full open source methodology. So this is just the minimum bar that is necessary to enable that. Uh, yeah, the minimum bar, this is not about the best practices in open source. We can all think about how we've experienced open source in m really much better ways than these minimum requirements. But these are the minimum requirements that enable others to take the project or service and pursue those, uh, those better open source practices. So again, all of the services Code and assets necessary to operate the service are shared under an open source license and publicly accessible. And a public contributor can use the same workflow as a typical team member to make a change to the service. There's, of course, a link down there to the, to the full, you know, non-slide version of this with, with a lot, of, uh, lot more details in it. Um, and uh, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll share that link at the end of the, of the talk. So this leaves a lot of questions, of course. Like, wait, these are very, very broad uh, requirements. Like, they could be applied in different ways. Like, what about X, Y, Z? So in that link, if you follow it, you'll notice that there is a FAQ with some basic questions and answers of, wait a second, what does this actually mean for this aspect or the other? I'm going to go through some simple uh, slide versions of those answers. Of course, they're much more fully described in the document. And as with all of this, it is open for contributions, for pull requests directly, and the link to do a pull request we shared at the end of this uh, talk. So the first question, what is a service? We already talked about this. A service is software operated for the user. Software the user is operating for themselves is not considered a service. Pretty obvious. Moving on. What assets, which we talk about assets here, should be open source? And the, the answer is, Make everything open by default, except where law, security, privacy, or common sense says otherwise. It's not required that dependencies of the service, whether it's deployment dependencies or other services that are connected to, are themselves open source for the service to be open source. Mm -hmm. could, you t could you speak up? No. So the question is, uh, when we talk about assets, do we mean the hardware or other things that the software is running on? And no, we're using assets here in the, in the term that many uh, developers use for different, different pieces, not just code, but the, the operational scripts, the, the, the images, the um, API definitions, and other, other such assets. Right. Right. So the word is confusing because uh, there's an initiative for open hardware, so one can think of assets in those terms. That's a good point. Then the question, should tests be shared with the code? Well, tests that are used during the operation of the service, maybe monitoring, metrics, uh, availability tests, and so on, absolutely are part of the service, and according to requirement one, should be open. And secondly, Tests run when making changes to the service during the contribution workflow, the CI tests, all of that, in order to meet these requirements, must be open source. It's, of course, recommended that further tests are open source. That's always a good practice. But further testing, whether it's uh, performance or intrusion testing or all sorts of other things that, don't, that are not the two requirements don't apply to, yeah, it's up to, the, up to the service whether to apply open source there. So the minimum requirements just require that those tests that are used in those two requirements are open. Um, should anyone, this is a common question that comes up, should anyone be able to trigger CI or test suites? Well, no, this is not required. Most of, your op of the projects that you run, if they have CI, have a, have a small set of contributors, core contributors, who perhaps are able to uh, trigger the CI or uh, let CI run on someone else's pull request. And that same principle applies here. Um, must, must a contribution workflow be documented? Well, documentation is typically necessary in order for a team member or someone to come up to speed and make changes to the service. So if that's required, then yes, 
we should, we should share that documentation about how to contribute. Um, must it be possible for anyone to operate the service themselves to make another instance of it? Well, uh, if a typical team member takes the, 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 the source code or the service and runs it themselves in order to make a change to it, well then yes, you should share that ability with folks in the, in the public. But if that's not necessary, there's many services where the team members are not launching a whole instance of the service in order to change it. Well, then it's not necessary to make sure that everyone can operate it. This, these requirements serve to make it sure that someone else can add that ability if necessary, to run it somewhere else on a different infrastructure or to run multiple copies of it or to change it in some way. These are the minimum requirements that enable such a thing, but it's not necessary uh, to meet that up front. So must all the dependencies for a service be open source too? Well, no, this is not required. A service can be open source without all of its infrastructure, its dependency, the hardware that it runs on, or the APIs that it uses, or other services that it interacts with to be open source as well. Um, but these requirements, again, enable a public contributor to abstract out things that are proprietary, to change them, to replace them with open source alternatives. And that is the goal here. So by meeting this minimum bar, you enable others to take this aspect further. And so must there be a community for the service? And this is amazing when a community forms around a project, but the reality is most of our open source projects do not have a community around them. And many uh, of my projects, your projects, have no more than a single contributor. So it is great when that happens, and we want to enable that for a service, but it's not necessary in order to apply open source minimum requirements. And so here are two links that go into the requirements, and of course, opening a pull request to these to change things, to have discussion about, wait a second, here's an aspect that's not covered, or here's something that, 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 that makes this not be that self-evident minimum set of requirements that we should meet in order to have open source applied to our services. And I would encourage you know, anyone who wants to participate to participate to, um, in, in all sorts of ways on this. But I'm, I'm hoping, and Michelle's gonna talk about services that are applying this, or how different services meet these requirements or don't meet them, where the gaps are, and specific um, applications of this. So, how much time do we have? We have uh, six minutes. Six minutes. So we'll have questions now, and then questions after Michelle talks about more of the concrete stuff. Yep. Right, that's a, it's a very good question and one that we should have discussion around. The place I would start is with the current licenses. So the choice of license for the code already makes a prescriptive choice for um, the service about the libraries that are included. The question is, I'm sorry for not repeating it, that um, what if we include libraries in the, in the service? Where do we draw the line between what we require to be open source and what we don't? And so. I think we start with the licenses first. Um, that is the first requirement. We choose a license that reflects the behavior that the service would like on whether it's it, all, everything that is launched with the service, for example, with a GPL, is, is, uh, is required also to be open source or not. But the second thing is that uh, things that are outside of this, I, would, I, would, uh, I believe, are things that are deploying the service, things that are uh, monitoring the service, things that are um, obviously outside of the service itself. Um, those things should be available to contributors so that they can contribute, but the line, I, I believe, the minimum requirements don't require that those things are open source up front. If we, if we can replace them with open source uh, alternatives, I think we have a real win there, and over time we build more open source uh, services, but for, to meet these minimum requirements, I don't think we have to, 
be that contagious with everything that the service touches. Next question. Yeah. Right. Like a might somewhere else, right? Right. Yeah, so the, the code is good, right? But they don't like it for business purposes. Exactly. So the question is, are we required to take contributions that we don't like from a business perspective or for any other reason into the service itself? And the answer is no. The same the same principle applies as your other open source projects. These minimum uh, requirements serve to enable a contributor who you don't agree with to fork your service. It's difficult, like we said, to make a second copy of the service or to duplicate that, but these enable that behavior, just like forking an open source project. So that same open source dynamic applies here. We either, we either use whatever mechanisms to come to an agreement, or we have branches or some other mechanism to involve other people in the project and the service itself, or it enables forking so that we can have that drastic escape hatch for people who literally don't agree and they can kind of uh, do an evolutionary move of uh, survival of the fittest and see who wins, right? Next question, yep. Um, so the, I mean, we've spoken about this in previous DevCons. I think, it, I mean, it was a remote DevCon 2021, I think it was. I would love to see a world where we enable contributors to contribute to a service without having to operate it themselves, where they see their change running against their data and can do this. I believe that would be an amazing place to do, and, and I'm very excited by that kind of uh, outcome. But that is far beyond these minimum requirements. So I, did, I shared this to kind of share a bit of the why. Why am I concerned about services with regards to open source? Why are they currently seem to be diverging and not reconciled? And I believe we have a lot of cool things we can do in this, with this. Um, and we need to go far beyond these minimum requirements. But I think they just get us started and enable the rest to be discovered. Cool. So I'm going to hand over to Michael. So um, welcome to the second part. Um, now, Steph basically did the motivational management, make it happen uh, part of it. And um, I'm going to be the engineering complement uh, of actually making those things happen and, and how to make those things happen. I said, like, uh, I think it's, it's actually, I mean, the, the reasoning behind why we would want those things is it's very sound. It's the same reasoning basically behind uh, open source software by itself. Um, but it's, it's not as, as evident for, for an engineering type of person of, of how this now actually can be implemented. Um, so I don't need to. And so uh, I think the discussion about minimum requirements kind of like might obscure that this is actually more of a journey than, than an end goal. Um, a service can be partially open source. Um, so it, it is an incremental happening. And that's what engineers do, right? Like we, we don't mind too much to work on the same project for a couple of years. And I mean, we know that it's not ideal. Um, that's why we continue to improve it. And the same goes for the open sourcing of something like this. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the engineering side, but there's another aspect um, that needs to be taken into account, and that's, that's the social aspect. So if we are talking about incremental improvements um, for an engineer, that's kind of like changing code, changing deployments, changing whatever. But there are also attitudes involved of people. There are uh, fears of people involved. And they might actually need changing as well to get to this place of open source services. Um, and that's not included in the talk. So that's, that's maybe another talk for another DevConf to do. So we thought about like how, how would you actually uh, strategically go about this whole thing, uh, getting, getting this uh, marching order of open source your service. And we thought that, that it would be interesting for, for taking this general idea and decomposing it into something that's actually actionable. 
Um, so we try to come up with a scorecard of like how open source is your service, kind of like this, this, this card game, right? Like you can, you can say like my service is more open source than yours. Um, and it should allow us to actually identify gaps like uh, the ones where we would lose, like which pieces are not there, where they should be. Um, and actually applying this scorecard to different services might allow us to, to um, pick ideas from other projects because they're all open source, right? Like, so if somebody solves one of those aspects in a better way, then it actually might be something that we should adopt in one way or the other. So I, I will um, put down the scope again. So um, this is about services, but a lot of this is actually also applicable to other open source projects. But just here, it's, it's now limited to services where software is run for users. Um, now, those users might actually be not just the strangers on the internet. Um, if you are a public service, um, yes, that's true. But if you are in a company environment, you might have those internal customers that are really angry if your service is down. And that might be something uh, where you would invite contributions uh, as well uh, to get stuff fixed. So if you could pick their brains or if they could file a merge request to fix the issues that they see, you would already gain, gain quite a bit. So thinking about community, uh, and what this might mean for whatever project you have might, might make sense. And these are, this is a list of stuff. Uh, so this is like me at night brainstorming after we had the, the talk settled. Um, coming out of the questions and answers that uh, in the previous talk. So it was about assets, like the code, uh, everything that is in the Git repository basically. Um, the workflow that people can actually contribute in an open way. How do you deploy this service? And that's, that's like the secret source of most services, like how Amazon deploys Postgres into their infrastructure. I don't know, nobody knows, I suppose, but it would be kind of cool. Uh, and it would be required to like, kind of hack on RDS. Um, but it's also in, um, related to, to the communication style. Like, is this actually a transparent process? Like, how hard is it actually to, um, to, to talk to people, um, is, are there documentation, is there documentation available? Um, do they have procedures for running it if something fails? What do they do? I mean, if you want to run a service, that's something you would also need. Um, and if you have to develop this from, from scratch, that's basically not, not possible to do. Um, are, are issues tracked in a transparent way? Or is it like this secret stuff where you see issues and then 95% of the comments are private and you don't even see them. So you don't see that there's stuff happening on them. Uh, or you don't see those issues at all. Um, and then uh, can you actually see people operating the service? Is this something where you can observe and learn um, how it's done so that you can improve on it? But yeah, so I could go into the details, but maybe, maybe that's not the best. So we just directly skip to some examples. So um, we are going to take two services um, and then try to figure out like how they are doing. Um, so luckily it's not Santa doing the uh, evaluation. So we're going to, to look at two projects. One is the one that Veronica talked about um, in the previous talk, which is the uh, continuous integration as a service project for kernel developers, which is the CKI project. Um, it's an internal project. It's, it's aimed at internal developers. That's the business reason for it. But there's an extended business reason that it tries to prevent bugs from getting into the upstream kernel first, because that is actually going. I mean, we are a Red Hat team. Uh, we want to prevent those bugs to actually hit the Red Hat kernel. If, um, and we would like to get stuff fixed before it actually happens. And the other uh, project we are going to look at is, is GitLab itself. Uh, so GitLab is like this other GitForge. I don't know whether people have experience with it, but um, it's not GitHub. Uh, they have a different business model. They are um, selling you uh, local instances that you can install. There's a community edition. Um, it's an open core business. Uh, but they also have a managed instance, which um, is um, managed in a, in a really interesting way, um, in a very transparent way. And they consider themselves as the open company. Um, and the bottom line contains how we score this, right? Like this is now we are in the, um, we nowadays use emojis for scoring, right? Like uh, we don't do plus one and minus one, so um, we use emojis for this. So I just ask, we just look at Veronica all the time and I talk about CKI, whether she agrees or not. But um, so 
Uh, CKI is um, regarding open assets, pretty okay. So they, they have all their source code in gitlab.com, but it took them 18 months to get there. So this was like a, a mixed, mixed model, stuff in the open, stuff internal, and uh, especially uh, moving stuff from the internal space and consolidating it into the public space um, is harder than it sounds uh, most of the times because people <coughs> tend to kind of like get messy if nobody is looking, right? Like you, you mix internal information into it, it makes it really hard to actually open it up. But so this happened. Dependencies are open source as well, but then uh, we test on RHEL, so RHEL is private, so this is something that external people have problems maybe reproducing bugs, for example, on RHEL. Um, and they are, it would be kind of nice to have external tests available, but then this doesn't really apply for CKI because there are no penetration tests or something running against it. But for, for other services, it might be actually applicable. So okay, that, that's, that's, that's a check mark. Um, this is hosted on GitLab.com, and GitLab.com is actually pretty good in, in enabling uh, a workflow for internal and external contributors. So this, it's the same workflow for everybody, obviously, because it's a small project. There's no documentation available how to do this properly, but it's, it's merge requests, so it's not hard. You basically fork it and, and open a pull request. And there are, there are bots coming into it, and they can talk to them, and if you say please, they will be in color or something. But there's, there's something to, to trigger, for example, integration tests um, that is mostly self-evident, hopefully. Most of those features um, are mitigated by permissions, and I think that's, it's very similar to what people would do on GitHub. Um, so you try to kind of like limit the exposure of your internal infrastructure, but still try to make it possible for, for people to participate. Um, a pretty important aspect is actually that people will feel welcome, so you so you need to be nice to them, but that also means that you're actually going to look at their contributions if those contributions come in. Um, and for CKI, that's pretty okay. Just looking at the statistics, most merge requests are merged within a couple of hours, but this is the same for external or internal ones. So let's, let's go to, to some, some uh, uglier aspects of the whole thing. So um, how do you deploy kernel testing as a service externally? Yeah, you just don't. Um, so there's, I think, one lab where people do this, but it's because it was never required, really hard to do. It's really annoying to set up. Um, I don't think most team members would be able to do it. Um, it's this thing that, that exists. It's GitOpsified, but it's still, it's still not, it was never necessary. It's, it's a huge barrier to entry to actually get this thing running. There's no way to run it on your laptop. While there might not actually be a good reason that this is that hard, right? Like you can run a GitLab instance on your laptop, we will see it. Um, and yeah, the infrastructure repository is also not available. And why? Because it mixes secrets and internal information. It's kind of like this mess that somebody would need to detangle and nobody can be bothered. It's just like thankless work because you will just break something. We have good documentation for like not how to set up the service, but actually how to operate the service because that's what we are doing. Um, there are some company internal guidelines that, that can't be opened up, um, but other than that, everything is visible. And also the operating procedures are actually accessible. Um, it's possible to do this, uh, even if there's internal stuff in there, you can actually tease those things apart as something that, that, that is done. Um, but as a company internal project, we don't have a code of conduct. Now, if you talk about communicating, it becomes interesting to discuss like who you want to communicate with. So if you're talking about communication with upstream, like this is one of the goals of, of the CKI project, and it's actually pretty hard to do if there's a mailing list, and that's basically it. You can't look at the source as it's made, or the sausage as it's made. Um, it's a very intransparent process. But if you're talking about internal kernel developers, which is a really important audience also for contributions, we have a channel. You can jump in. We are, yeah, the CKI project, pretty friendly folks. Um, so that's, that's a pretty OK uh, experience. But then there are easy, easy gains, like having a meeting where people can just jump in and ask questions, like, like in-person video meetings. We are a remote team. So. Um, and then an interesting aspect is that, that um, next to like, official issues and, uh, and the team channel, a lot of discussions happens in those documents that people just create. I mean, 
Google document, a markdown and something. Um, and that's, that's also something that can be actually solved and it would lower the barrier of entry, but it's not something that's, that's done properly. Uh, all the issue tracking is on GitLab, so that's fine. Um, even though it's an internal team and most external contributors will never look at it, but it still shows how it works. And then, yeah, we just skip it because it's, it's, um, it's the, the very intransparent, I'm not going over the list, but how CKI is run is not visible on the outside. So this is a huge gap um, that would prevent people from actually running it because they can't see how it's done, they can't observe it. So we have two, two parts, like there's, there's, there's a good part, there's a bad part, and um, we are not talking about the ugly part, there's no ugly part. Um, so let's, let's look at, at something else, which is um, the GitLab project. So they consider themselves as the open source company, uh, or the open company. Um, they have everything on GitLab itself. That's their main product. They are their first user. They are their heaviest user, most likely. Um, everything that they need to run is open source as well, because you can just spin it up on your laptop. Um, whether there's anything missing from, from the pub public view, you can't figure out from the public view. So we don't know whether there's anything secret for, for testing, for example. But, but let's say open assets, it's there. Um, we have people contributing from Red Hat to GitLab. So it's, it's this contributor workflow. Like Red Hat people are annoyed. Um, it doesn't work. Um, and they come in and fix it. And Lucas is actually a kernel developer, uh, basically contributing to Ruby code. Um, working on those issues that annoy us, us as, as the users, that they don't, like GitLab doesn't care enough, but we care. And we have a developer basically fixing those issues and they accept them. They have a really good workflow. They have uh, coaches to move those things along. So they, they, they spend a huge effort and it works. It's something that, that, can, that is open for contribution in the best, best case. Um, you can just go through their documentation on how they do deployment. On You can go through their repositories of how they do deployment. There are some things that are missing, but it's, it's, it's an engineer's paradise. If you want to go in and, and figure out how they do it, um, you can just spend weeks and weeks reading code and documentation. And so it's just, yeah, it's, it's available. And there's nothing happening. Like there's, there's internal information in those operating procedures, for example, and they just, accept it. It's something that they accept as the price for, um, for the openness. They have something interesting from the engineering, uh, from the management perspective. They have their management handbook online. So you can look at um, how they actually want people to work. And it's, it's a very interesting one. It's, it, it tells how people should communicate, that they should be open, that it should happen in a public venue. And this shows there might be internal, um, internal aspects to it, but it's not something that seems to be missing. From the outside. And yeah, obviously issues are still also tracked. And you can read about their strategy. So if you're, from, um, if, if you're wondering like, where is GitLab going as a customer? Is this moving in the direction you care about? You can actually look at, at those documents. So there's no management secret source as well. Right? This is not something that you would normally require from an open source service, but it's, it's very interesting for a customer to know where the company is going and whether this actually matches uh, your use case. And you can look at them if, why they run it, especially if it fails. It's beautiful. Um, it fails. Your monitoring goes off. You, yeah, uh, you're using it. and. Um, our monitoring goes off and you go in there and you can look at them freaking out or not freaking out. I mean, these are like people that don't freak out. Um, and you can watch how they try edge issues in real time. And it's highly interesting uh, for learning um, if you want to do it yourself, for example. So they are, they are doing some really, really beautiful things. And some of those things, there's, there's a mostly behind some of those points. So sometimes, even they have a limit where they, where they say like, okay, we are not going to share this. This is not something we want to do. But so let's, let's, let's recap that because I'm an engineer. I'm trying to run a service as, as an open source service. Um, and having this scorecard actually was quite eye-opening, pointing it at, at one of our services. Um, 
to, to find out where, the, where gaps are and, and what, what kind of um, things we would need to fix to actually m move it to minimal requirements or to move it further. Uh, and it shows that it's more of a journey than, than really like m getting this bar and then basically being done with it. It's, it's never done. And I think stuff has this tendency to regress in places that people keep stuff internal, um, don't share certain information. And um, it's actually not that. Um, it's, it's, nev it's never finished. We heard this sentence before about Linux. And running an open source service is also something that needs to be reinforced once in a while. Um, and it would be interesting to continue this, because uh, just having a scorecard is one part. But most likely, you could actually make something like a playbook out of it, where you could, if somebody comes and says, like, I would want to open my service, actually tell them different steps that they would need to follow to, to get somewhere. Um, so yeah, the, the earlier you start, the, the better it is. So that's, that's basically the thing. And so if, if somebody has a service that they want to evaluate in the, in the following couple of minutes, I have empty slides with all those points. So if somebody is up for it, we can, we can evaluate the openness of the service like within a couple of minutes. But, um, otherwise, that's, that's it. I don't dare to admit it, but, but this was like me at night coming up with slides. Um, but I think it is quite, yeah, you could, you could actually, but then it would need to do it properly, right? Like this was, this was like a one person, let's let people review it, scorecard. But then Steph didn't really look funny while I presented it, so most likely it's not too bad. But uh, I think it would need to be done properly to, to be actually something to move into policy. Oh yeah, and the question was like, is this public? This is basically what there is. So there's not, not more than this. Yeah. 